My name is Dennis Kiernan. Uh, I have a son, Jimmy Kiernan. He's uh, got an alternating hemiplegia of childhood. Uh, he's 22 years old now. He was diagnosed at about two years old. Yeah, my experience with it began when, when Jimmy was born. The nurse noticed rapid eye movement uh, that day. So they immediately put him on phenobarbital. And that lasted for six months, and they, they claimed that he had epilepsy. Uh, it turns out he never had epilepsy. I insisted that they take it off of uh, phenobarbital, and that's after seeing three different doctors. And then they put him on Tegretol, and then they put him on uh, Depakote, and some other. They kept going from one seizure med to another seizure medicine. And, uh, and all of them did absolutely nothing. Uh, there was no paralysis, no AHC signs until approximately nine months of age. Uh, and at about nine months of age, uh, is when he first got paralyzed. And I took him into the emergency room and uh, they started asking me questions like, did I swing him around? Did I, uh, you know, grab him violently? And uh, I had no idea what was going on. So, you know, I was ready to, to admit to anything. I didn't know what the story was. But it turns out, you know, I, uh, it, it, the diagnosis remained epilepsy despite EEGs that were perfectly normal. Uh, and, and every time I'd ask questions, the doctors would say, oh, that's because the skull cap didn't fit quite right. So, uh, you know, so they stuck with the epilepsy story. If finally my sister found an article in a, new, in a journal that mentioned Dr. McCarty and uh, he was up at Boston Children's Hospital, and I called him, and he returned my call that night. Uh, and about 10 o'clock at night, I talked to him, and one of the first questions he asked me was, when he goes to sleep, is he, does he move around? And I never heard any question. Nobody asked anything like it. And as soon as he asked me that question, I knew that he knows something that nobody else does, you know, and then, and then I made an appointment to go up and see him, and we went up there for an 11-day uh, continuous EEG monitoring, and there were two other kids there with AHC, and, uh, and that's how it, uh, my beginning part was brutal, terrible part. You know, all the misdiagnosis, the doubling up on medicines when I say he's paralyzed again, you know, and they still say, oh, well, when's his next dose? How about giving him the next dose now and then, you know, delay the other one by one hour, you know? So it was always something, and he'd, be, he'd go into tremors just from too much medicine. So finding McCarty really was a godsend. Jimmy's condition, uh, you know, there is quite a bit of, uh, well, there's retardation involved. You know, there are mental deficiencies, uh, difficulties, there were de developmental delays. He didn't walk or talk until he was four years old. So, and that was pretty rough. You know, you kind of give up hope. At a three and a half years of age, you start to almost give up hope. But not quite, uh, but eventually he did, and and he was a very cheerful, happy sort of kid, you know, a lot of fun, uh, but just, you know, very, very, very delayed. Uh, things, uh, the paralysis was sometimes brutal. He, he was paralyzed on both sides of his body one time for 23 days straight, and when he came out of that, only one eye came back to center, and at Duke uh, Ice Center, they operated on, on that to, to bring the other eye back, because the guys told me that if you don't correct it at a, within a certain amount of time, the brain will forget to see in stereo. So, and nobody had told me that before. So 
there are a lot of things that you learn and a lot of scary moments that you have. Uh, his, he's always been pretty skinny, uh, very strong, but skinny and, and uh, but happy-go-lucky, I'd have to say. Well, except for 10% of the time. And then, and then it becomes uh, rage, aggression, uh, and things progress from when they're little and you can handle them by just moving them to the side or picking them up and, you know, set, sitting them in a chair. And then later on, they're big enough. They could fight back, and they do, and, uh, or he did. I don't want to say for everybody, but, but I know that that's not uncommon. And uh, in his case, it was pretty severe. I mean, very strong, very, very determined. The same determination that made him try to walk when he was paralyzed, it also made him try to get at you when, when he didn't like something. But it only lasts about 20 minutes, and then it would disappear, and he'd become an angel again. In my opinion, the episodes don't have any triggers except for uh, water. When he goes into a pool or a river or a lake or a heated pool, any kind of thing like that, except the bathtub, he'll become paralyzed within 10 seconds. But otherwise, Sometimes he's excited all day and nothing happens. The next time he's excited and he's paralyzed. Another time he's peaceful laying there and then you see he's, he's paralyzed or, or getting stiff, this, you know, this dystonia. And it just, uh, you know, it just seems to happen. Sometimes I could picture that it's going to happen because he'd start to do certain, have certain mannerisms. I could go... Tsh and he'd make that repetitive sound, ch, ch. and then I'd look at him and start noticing that he's not walking so good or his arms up a little in the air. Same thing sometimes if I held his hands and one hand's real cold and the other one's clammy, like wet, uh, then I'd know that he's probably gonna get paralyzed pretty soon and i try to get him somewhere safe or, or figure things out from there. So, but those were about the only triggers. I never found triggers to be lights or things like that. Really, realistically, my hope is that uh, we find some way of coping with the, with, the, with the condition itself, reduce the number of episodes, reduce the paralysis, re reduce the severity, this dystonia, things like that. But I think for the people who are already born, I think the chances of them doing much intellectually and things like that are, are past. I don't think you can undo that. But all the information that is being gathered, the genetic study that shows uh, AHC, that was, that was very good for me because I always felt guilty. I always thought maybe something I did as a, you know, a teenager caused, a, you know, something to go wrong with him. I always thought somehow it might be inherited from me or whatever. There was always that sort of guilt, but as far as far as, as far as really figuring out something to reverse all of it, I can't see that. But I can see that the kids of the future will get diagnosed early, won't get destroyed, you know, mentally, physically by improper drug treatments, and and uh, will will get the proper uh, educational assistance, you know, speech therapy, uh, music therapy, any kind of therapies, things like that, so that they're going to go as far as they can. You know, it might not be where other kids are going, but who cares? That's other kids. But, but 
for, for them, they'll, they'll get a, as good a shot and as good a chance as, as uh, anybody could hope for. When Dr. McCarty put Jimmy on flunarazine, uh, it, it started to reduce, uh, and it was flunarazine plus Ativan eventually, you know, soon after. When, when the experiments with the flunarazine came about and he was taking that, there was a reduction in the f severity of the, of the episodes. Prior to that, the paralysis would be accompanied by a lot of grinding his teeth, a lot of like, uh, you know, moaning and groaning, and, and just, you could see he was in horrible pain. That kind of disappeared, and it went to like, if he's going to be paralyzed seven days, it would be two days where he's off and on paralyzed, an hour here, three hours good, an hour there, two hours good, and then it might be a two or three days of just half paralyzed all day, and then it would taper off to uh, uh, broken up episodes, and, and so it, it, loose, it reduced that, uh, that aspect of it. It wasn't morning to night, morning to night. It did help. It's not perfect, and the eventual dystonia, I don't know what to do, the, the Valium that he, t he takes as needed for, for dystonia helps tremendously. Uh, in my experience, that one, it breaks it up pretty quick. And, and you know, because a lot of times he'll start slurring. He's, he's just, it's like his mouth or tongue is thickened and he, you know, just becomes incoherent. And, uh, and then I'll give him a little medicine. And that brings up something that, you know, just slightly, but his pride. A lot of times, the, the, he's, he's got so much pride. Besides the determination, he's got pride. And he didn't want me ever to take the wheelchair with him. And so sometimes we'd go somewhere, and I know he's probably going to get paralyzed, but he wouldn't hear of it. He wanted me to leave it, so I left it, and then I'd have to carry him back. Well, Jimmy, he went to school in preschool and, and like a nursery school and kindergarten and the, the younger grades, you know, first grade, second grade, third. All of that, he went to school and had fun. It was a great time. When it started getting to the higher level grades and especially to the schools like middle school and high school where they switch classes from one group to another group to another group then he kind of became a little bit lost you know they you know the, in the beginning the teachers knew him all the kids in the class knew him and everybody looked after him but later on it became more isolated uh you try to keep things social, you try to keep him in social situations. He loves to dance, he loves uh, music, so I try to bring him to all kinds of events, any kind of, any, anything that I could find. I know people who play music, you know, bluegrass music around here, and and he, he'd have a blast. But, uh, but he did become more and more isolated, and I think you know, despite maybe low IQ as far as testing is concerned, he's got a lot of smarts. He knows things, he can sense things, he feels how a person views him, what, how, when a person, how a person behaves around him. So he's very perceptive and uh, he started to, I think, he started to feel a little bit of isolation uh, less people come by your house, you know, it's me and him. Less friends of mine come around, there's no kids in the neighborhood. When they want to play ball, they're not going to call for him to see if he, he'd play ball, because he can't. But, so you start losing out on a lot of things, and, and getting older it has very big drawbacks. And then, now that he's 22, He's done with all schools. There's no more school. Uh, 
It finishes, they're, they're allowed to go through their 21st birthday and finish out that year. And he had a wonderful last two years at Radford University. It was a nice setup of good people. And uh, he had jobs like watering the plants and, and do, collecting recycled bags. It was fun. We'd walk around with, with some student mentor and, and have fun. Uh, but now that's gone. And I don't have any, uh, I don't have any options, none that I could think of. Jimmy's episodes were very much paralysis in the beginning. It was almost entirely paralysis for early years up until about age 10 or 12. Then it became a lot more stiffness, a lot more tonic and dystonic kind of things, uh, which, you know, just changed it. But on average, he would be paralyzed probably four out of seven days for some period of time, maybe not the whole time, but about four or five days of, of a week, he'll, he'll be paralyzed for a couple hours here, maybe at night again, he'll become stiff. Uh, and and it, it hasn't really varied except for how it presents itself. At about 15, he developed epilepsy with seizures, which was a total shock. I thought he was past, I know 50% are supposed to, you know, have a, possibly develop it. I thought he would have by eight or 10. When it got to 15, I thought, safe. But all of a sudden, it, that started. That caused huge problems also. Uh, so things do change, and it, it's just like everything. There's more difficulty in actually carrying them around. You know, if I have to carry them back to the car or do things with them, uh, it it's just puts more of a strain on everything, and he becomes a little more isolated. But as far as the episodes, they're pretty much uh, controlled, so to speak. You know, they, they haven't worsened. They've evolved. A lot of head, you know, sudden head turning, then that's a recent development. Never used to do that. A lot of mouth movements that didn't used to appear. But the paralysis and the dystonia, it's the frequency probably stayed the same throughout the years. I think the one big message that I would give to any parent, you know, other than dealing with all the medical issues, is to, to stay happy, bright, think of things from the kid's perspective. Sometimes I think there's too much of a tendency to, if the kid gets paralyzed, automatically you figure this thing caused it. All of a sudden you're not bringing them in stores because there's too much fluorescent lights are too wild or there's too many people around so you start bring keeping them sheltered or you make them look funny I'll say by you know dressing them up differently to protect them from sun or from ultraviolet lights or, or I mean fluorescent lights and sometimes it even pushes them further and further I think let them do everything they can. If they get hurt, so what? It doesn't matter that much. I mean, he has broken collarbone, you know, clowning around. A lot of things have happened. You try to protect them all you can, but sometimes you got to really let them run. You got to let them do stupid things just like all kids do because Basically, they are just like any kid. They want to feel loved. They want to feel cared for. They want to feel like, like important and part of the gang. So I, w I would really push the parents to, to lighten up on some of the aspects of it, you know, thinking too hard about how to protect them and think more about how to get them out into society 
and how to make them feel comfortable around people. You know, ones with big families, it's, it's probably easier. Uh, ones with smaller families or, you know, by yourself, you, you really got to look out and ask for help. You know, you got you to gotta do it because that's sometimes more important than the, the medical issue, uh, just the social issue, just the happiness factor. You want them to really grow and feel pride in themselves that they are capable of doing it. And you're not always saying like, oh, no, come here. No, come here. Oh, hey, wait. Oh, you know, yeah. you just say, all right, he's gone, you know and let them run. Not around traffic, but in the woods or in the meadows. Sure, let them do what they want. Uh, the other thing I'd say is to really look into therapies, music therapy, speech therapy, any kind of thing like that, occupational therapy, stacking washes onto a wooden stick, you know, anything with the dexterity, anything that will make part of their brain maybe activate. I wanted my son to always go barefoot, and he never would, and it, I wish he would have, because I wanted him to feel grass, I wanted him to feel pavement, I wanted him to feel wood, you know, because uh, I just think all of that's important. The more you expose them to, the better off they'll be eventually. My message to parents would be to let the kids have some more liberties to experience life. Don't be so restrictive with what they're doing or how they're behaving. Don't, don't worry about small stuff. Let them go out and, and get every, every experience that they possibly can to make them well-rounded, make them happier, and have more of a feeling of confidence.